Mr. President, <laughs> members of conference. I rang my husband, Steve, last year from Southport to tell him that I'd been designated as vice president. It was after the initial kind of congratulations and shared excitement, there was a pause. You know, it feels a bit like it did when you told me you were pregnant. <laughs> he said, I'm very excited and a bit scared. I know we've got about nine months to get used to the idea. <laughs> and although it's going to turn my life upside down, I'm conscious it's you who's going to go through most of the pain. And just like pregnancy and bringing up children, I feel the vice presidency is going to be a bit of a family affair, although hopefully with fewer nappies. <laughs> My children will be at home um, Skyping me, or hopefully on occasions they'll be travelling with me to see bits of Methodism beyond our own church. My husband's friends, parents and parents-in-law are going to be offering invaluable help with the childcare and the school runs to enable me to travel. And then there's the wider family of Methodists and Christian sisters and brothers who I know will be praying for Roger and me as we embark on this new task that you have entrusted to us. Thank you. Before I go on, I want to just tell you about what my children call my shakies. I've got a condition called an essential tremor, which means that my hands shake often quite a lot. You'll find this week um, that I'm not very good at holding papers without a lectern. I can't distribute the elements for communion. And my colleagues will tell you that I'm absolutely lethal if you try and give me a cup of tea with a saucer. <laughs> and you really don't want me offering to do brain surgery on you. <laughs> so give me a lectern, give me a mug, and I'm absolutely fine. So, at the beginning of this year's Methodist conference, I'm mindful of the words of the prophet Amos, who offers a very serious reflection on how we should use the gift of the time that we've got together. And here I'm using the words from the message. I can't stand your religious meetings. I'm fed up with your conferences and conventions. I want nothing to do with your religious projects, your pretentious slogans and goals. I'm sick of your fundraising schemes, your public relations, and your image making. I've had all I can take of your noisy ego music. When was it the last time you sang to me? Do you know what I want? I want justice, oceans of it. I want fairness, rivers of it. That's what I want. That's all I want. And we live in a world where we need oceans of justice. In the UK, more than one in four children live in poverty, and 300,000 of them face destitution, the severest form of poverty that we thought we'd, had been banished. One in every 113 people in the world is a refugee or is internally displaced, and more than 3,700 refugees are thought to have died last year alone crossing the Mediterranean. Water scarcity affects four in 10 people, and climate change is making rainfall even more variable. Every 90 seconds, a child dies because of a water-related disease, and two million people die each year because of a lack of safe water, sanitation, or hygiene. We know there are places all around the world where people of all faiths face persecution, torture, and death because of their beliefs. And today, just outside where we're meeting, thousands of people are meeting to protest. However you voted in the referendum, we live in a society that appears to be divided, ill at ease with itself, and uncertain of the future. And where people who look or sound different from the majority population are reporting that levels of abuse are rising. And of course, this has only highlighted and intensified the racism, which for many people is already a daily occurrence. So what should we as Christians, and what should the Methodist Church be doing about these injustices in our world? 
And why is it important to hold together holiness and justice, the theme which Roger and I have chosen for this year? If one understanding of holiness is the times, places or people where we recognise God breaking through, then I had a profoundly holy moment walking down Oxford Street as a teenager. It was in the late 1980s at a time when the numbers of people who were visibly homeless was rising. Walking past all the glitzy consumerism, I was following a man. He was a rough sleeper. He was carrying two large bags and he had a shabby coat tied up with a piece of string, shuffling along the street, oblivious to the bustle all around him. He stopped by a bin and started to fish in it. He pulled out some packaging from a fast food restaurant and opened up the carton. Inside were the remains of some chicken bones. He put the bone in his mouth and started to gnaw it. I felt then, as I feel now, as if I had been punched in the stomach. I felt the roar of the prophets. This is not right. This is not what God wants. This person is created in God's image. And God wants justice. Oceans of it. At the time, I was working at, uh, working, worshipping, at uh, Hind Street, um, the West London Mission. And I later spent time um, during my uh, year off there, before university, um, working at its Lambeth Walk-In Day Centre, where I met and drank hundreds of cups of tea with many more people just like the man on Oxford Street. Each one of them infinitely precious and created in God's image. We sometimes worry about what makes up the Methodist DNA, and we joke a lot about our love of committees but a large part of our DNA is just getting stuck in. We respond to the need we see around us and we do something. There are, for example, over 7,000 examples of Methodist churches around Britain that are involved in community projects, many of them supporting people who experience poverty, who are marginalised or are lonely, running food banks, night shelters, drop-ins for people, youth clubs, or even the coffee morning. We support charities with Methodist roots, such as Action for Children and All We Can. And of course, we don't just do things that have a Methodist label attached to them. Each of us responds to need we see around us through people and organisations of all faiths and none. But Methodists do things. We get stuck in. We see things are not right and we act because we're responding to people who are created in God's image. That's why, for me, holiness and justice is such an exciting theme to be able to explore. They're not polar opposites, the holy huddle versus the activist justice seeker, but they are inextricably entwined. We're delighted to have worked with the artist Rick Stott on the booklet Holiness and Justice, which I hope you all have a copy of. And the booklet explores through art and through words this intertwining and the challenge of the theme that we've chosen for our presidential year. And by the way, you can see Rick's original paintings uh, downstairs by the cafe. For me, it's not a matter of loving God first and then, as an outcome, loving our neighbour. It's less linear and much more circular. Responding to God's love for us seeing the sacredness of creation because God loves it. We love God and we love our neighbour. In loving our neighbour and seeking justice for them, our love for God finds concrete expression. It's enriched and we find a closeness with God. Because God has commanded us to walk with him in the ways of righteousness along the paths of justice. Walking the paths of justice means walking with God. And it's that closeness, closeness, that drawing together to the being of God that is holiness. The inner and the outer manifestations of God's love cannot be separated or take place sequentially. I've attended a Methodist church all my life 
Um, I've been a member for nearly 30 years, and I've been privileged to work for the Methodist Church for over 15 years now. In my work, I've been challenged to focus on what it means for God's people gathered in the Methodist Church to do justice, specifically in the context of politics. I know that our church is committed to justice. But today, I'd like to offer a challenge. How do we embody God's command to do justice? When we look at the poor and people who are in the need of justice, do we see a problem or do we recognise the face of Jesus Christ? Let me just take the risk and start with a bit of politics um, and talk about poverty in the UK. I think our society, our government, our politicians, our media have increasingly problematised people living in poverty. It's become common to talk about the pathways to poverty, a family breakdown, educational failure, worklessness, dependency, addiction and serious personal debt. Now it's true that you will often find these problems amongst people who are experiencing poverty. But you will also find the same problems amongst families who are wealthy. There are undoubtedly problems in our society. Problems that can have drastic consequences, especially for poorer families. But these are not the causes or pathways of poverty. In reality, they're a mixture of causes and effects and the messiness of life that affects rich and poor alike. And have you noticed, they're all presented as, as the fault of the individual. Your relationship broke down. You failed your exams. You don't work. You're addicted. You're in debt. Being in poverty is no longer about being poor. It's about being at fault. Let's listen instead to someone in poverty describe what poverty means to them. Poverty is not being able to do the things that are necessities. These things are important like gas and electric, bus fares, having to worry that your daughter has a hole in her shoe. She needs new shoes and I haven't got the money. What do I do? Do I get the gas or do I get the shoes? We've problematised the poor so much that we choose to look for the mother's faults rather than address the problem and the pain that not having enough money brings to her. And surely this is at the heart of our challenge in responding as Christians to God's passionate call for justice. In the Bible, we read that we encounter Jesus in three ways. Through the Holy Spirit, through bread and wine, and through the poor. Truly, just as you did this to the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. We tend to be quite good at the first two of these, but when we see people in poverty, do we see the face of Jesus Christ and want to listen and learn? Or do we see them as a problem? Do we want to fix them and sort them out? Fixes that cost them, but not us. Change them, but don't transform us. Around the country, we're seeing the emergence of poverty truth commissions. The first one was in Glasgow, and it took its motto from the post-apartheid South Africa. Nothing about us, without us, is for us. In poverty truth commissions, two groups of people are brought together. There are some who are an area's most influential and powerful citizens. And then there are people who experience the daily grind of poverty. Titles are left at the door and everyone's experience is welcome. The commissions work on the basis that people who experience poverty are able to shape the solutions and not just be recipients of uh, uninformed ideas of others. Otherwise, nothing will alter. So they've looked at the reality of the poverty gap, why things actually cost more when you're poor. They've looked at welfare reform and why so many people who are in work are nevertheless still in poverty. Everybody gets a space in the room and everyone is able to contribute to the solutions. And the Poverty Truth Commission in Scotland 
has been helping to change the way that that nation approaches poverty. The Scottish Parliament produced a report on poverty in Scotland, for example, in conjunction with the Poverty Truth Commission. Can you imagine a government co-publishing a report with people who are poor? And senior officials in the Scottish Government's social justice team each has a mentor with direct experience of poverty, which perhaps helps them to have a clearer understanding of reality, the reality of lives that are lived juggling sparse financial resources. Martin Johnson, one of my colleagues in the Church of Scotland, says that we often talk disparagingly about people and communities that we think need sorting out as being fragile. And he tells the story of his great-grandmother's wedding tea set, which was always kept locked away safely behind glass doors at home. One day his mother was dusting, and she handed the young Martin a teacup to hold while she cleaned. Take care with that, it's fragile, she said. Something being fragile didn't mean it was worthless, or needing fixing, or turning into something else. Being fragile meant it was wonderfully precious in and of itself to be treasured and held with wonder. Isn't that marvellously incarnational? We are all fragile. Deep down, or not so very deep down, we have flaws and fears and hurts and struggles. God doesn't come along and say, right, I will sort you out and make you into a line of perfect Christians. Rather, God chooses vulnerability, precariousness, and fragility. He cradles us like precious treasured pieces of china. And he sent his son, both divine and fragilely, fully human, to show us how to treasure and to love one another. In the amazing poetry of Charles Wesley, our God contracted to a span, incomprehensibly made man. John Wesley had a fierce heart for people in poverty, and he said some things which are deeply challenging to us, to our politics, and to our church. He said, one great reason why the rich in general have so little sympathy for the poor is because they so seldom visit them. And by the way, a person was rich, by Wesley's standards, if they had food and raiment for themselves and their family, and a little over. Nothing more than that made you rich. God's love is for everyone, and early Methodism appealed strongly to those who were poorer. Pope Francis has issued a challenge for today's church, not just to be a church for the poor, but to be a church of the poor. I wonder if we, as a church, sometimes struggle with the urge to fix people, to sort them out, rather than to be a church of the poor. And how much does this relate to our desire to be the host at every party? Hospitality is a good thing. We can give freely, we can share what God has given us. Often sacrificially, we can give it to people who have need. But being the host puts us in a place of control. Our house, our rules, my bat, my ball. Do we really know and understand what it costs people sometimes to step over the threshold, accept our hospitality, our agenda? All you need to do is visit a food bank and see the people on the pavement outside summoning up the courage to step over the threshold and ask for help. What would it mean for us to become guests instead, to receive rather than to be in a position of power when we assume it is our role just to give? What does justice look like if we put ourselves into the hands of others? Well, Perhaps it means that we can have a deeper understanding of what people really want and need. We've got better at doing this in our justice work in countries other than our own, I think. Christian Aid, for example, are very good at making sure that we hear clearly the voices of people from the Southern Hemisphere. 
and recently brought people from countries directly affected by a climate change to the climate conference in Paris. The Methodist charity All We Can identifies partners with whom it wants to work and then instead of telling them its own priorities says, what do you need to do? And then it works alongside them to help them achieve their goals. Earlier this year, I was very privileged to um, visit the Church of Pakistan. I arrived, obviously knowing the stories from the Western media about the country, but I left with a profound awareness of a bigger story, a truer story. The story of a Christian people who are often poor, misused, and facing the threat of violence. Indeed, the appalling Lahore Park bombings took place only two weeks after my visit. Yet it's also the story of a people who have a life or death commitment to building peace between faiths. We met with senior Muslim and Christian leaders who were committed to faith, friendship, and honest interfaith dialogue in a country where this can bring death. One young man said that without interfaith relations, his country simply has no hope. So I learned a lot. But how did that encounter challenge me? In many ways, but I'm still wrestling with two particular challenges I received during my visit. Firstly, we heard that um, Muslims were welcome to say prayers in one of the cathedrals during an interfaith visit because it was felt to be, thought to be, this, this, this is a sign of absolute hospitality, even though Christians are in a vulnerable minority. We still struggle with that idea as a church when we are part of the majority of faith in our country. And secondly, I was challenged about whether we fail to speak up for Christians in Pakistan because we're worried about it, fragile interfaith relations in this country. How do we hold those two together? The stereotypes I had previously ha held were challenged by meeting Christians and Muslims in Pakistan. I became more aware of our interconnectedness. I became more aware of the injustices that people are facing. And I realized I needed to be challenged by the very people that previously I might have dared to speak about. It's through getting to know people listening to them, offering practical help and support that the justice questions can helpfully emerge. When we move past the what fault can I fix in you question to the deeper why questions. Why are people sleeping on our church steps at night? Why are people attending our lunch club so deeply in debt? Why can't mums afford school uniform even when they're working? Why are so many people lonely? Why don't young people have anywhere to go of an evening? And why do some people feel they have no stake in the economy or the political system? And these are just questions prompted by this country. We're helped to find answers to these questions over a thousand cups of tea through knowing people well enough that we can ask and they can answer with the knowledge that they will be heard by holding each other's fragility and vulnerability as we tread into very precious holy spaces. And it's then that we start to see the thousand hidden injustices, injustices that are deep rooted in the way that we organize our society and our world, from the way that we talk about people without material resources, to the desperate future faced by the world's poorest being crushed by the impact of climate change. And perhaps we need to be cautious about interpreting too literally the proverb, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Should we be speaking up for those who can't speak for themselves? Or rather, enabling those who, for whatever reason, cannot speak, enabling them to find their voices, to speak for themselves. I hope then that we can have the audacity to speak out together for justice in our shared world. Because the church absolutely does have a role in speaking out. 
I've been very honoured to work within the Joint Public Issues team, which for this year marks its 10th and her 10th birthday. Baptist, Methodist, the United Reformed Church, and now the Church of Scotland, working together on issues of justice and peace. A really effective example of how we can work together ecumenically and make a difference. Last year, our churches worked, as you may well know, on the Rethink Benefit Sanctions campaign. Why did our denominations start talking about a really obscure bit of benefit policy? The answer is, it was precisely because we heard from churches running food banks about the massive increase in the number of people that they were seeing who were hungry because they'd had their benefits stopped or sanctioned. So, conversations with food banks and, most powerfully, with the people who had themselves been sanctioned led to new research and policy work by the churches. The foreword to the report was written not by the churches, but by people who had been sanctioned themselves. And as the churches publicly aligned themselves with people who had been sanctioned, those who were being publicly blamed for their poverty, more people spoke out. Friends, colleagues, members of our churches had the courage to say that they too had been sanctioned. We obviously wanted to talk as well with the people who could change the system with the MPs, but at first we found we couldn't get in. And that was until people from our churches, you, started writing to your MPs about it. And then we started being invited to meetings. We started to get a seat at the table. Over the last year, there have been marginal improvements to the sanctions regime, but this is a long game and we're keeping up the pressure. And it's great to see um, what happens with the uh, Red Fridays initiative as well. But it's the encounters with people who are most affected by this situation that gave rise to this piece of justice work by the church. It's just one example from my own experience. You will have others. Those times when your encounters, your deep conversations, have caused you to ask the question, why? When the justice questions break in through and because of the practical actions of our churches. Because this isn't some optional extra. This is part of the mission of the church, the kingdom of God coming on earth as it is in heaven. The mission of the church, God's mission, is to be involved not only in the alleviation of suffering, but also in the eradication of the roots of that suffering. Pity and compassion are vital responses. They're Christian responses. But this experience should only provoke within us the justice response the why questions. Yet, isn't this just one more thing for churches to do when we're already struggling sometimes to hold it together? But many churches already are involved in justice missions in a variety of ways, and perhaps unconsciously. From the full-scale full food bank to the drop-in coffee morning, which offers a haven to exhausted mums and destitute asylum seekers. To the church members who have a chat with the young people who are hanging around the church wall instead of seeing them as a threat or a nuisance. To the prayer group that holds different parts of the community in prayer before God every week. And then perhaps, like a mustard seed, someone in the congregation asks that why question about somebody they've met. Why are they hungry? Why are they homeless? Why are they lonely? And it can become like grit in the oyster, something that can't be ignored and can be transformative. As Dr. Helen Cameron of the Salvation Army, who I'm very honoured is with us here today, describes in her book, Just Mission, there are four ways in which we may encounter justice through our church life. In worship, we meet a God whose nature is just. And in our scriptures and discipleship, we encounter God's anger at injustice and the response that God requires. Through our hospitality, we build deeper relationships. And in our pastoral care, we sit alongside those who have been wounded by life. And perhaps we start asking why. 
In our acts of compassion, we reflect on the needs that we see around us and the injustices that underlie those needs. And through our life as God's people, we can testify that grace and hope fly in the face of the anger, despair and denial that injustice can bring. And if we are a church where justice flows, then we will be a place where people want to be, where more people will feel able to respond to God's call on their lives. As we seek to draw nearer to God, to see God in the faces of those around us, and particularly in the faces of those who are the poorest and the most in need of justice, then our longings for holiness and justice will go hand in hand. A commitment to justice and holiness will change us, and it will change the church if we have the courage. The courage to be a guest at the party instead of the host. The courage first to listen instead of speak. To ask why instead of rushing to offer solutions. But then together to speak and act boldly. The courage together to join in the mission of God that God invites us to share. And we do it all in the knowledge that with God, anything is possible. Do you know what I want? I want justice, oceans of it. I want rivers, I want fairness, rivers of it. That's what I want. That's all I want. Amen.